Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, host Casey Hinches turns a stack of cinder blocks into a raised bed for squash. We travel to Prairie Wind Nursery in Norman, Oklahoma, to look at great tough plants. Casey shows how to pinch, deadhead, and disbud to get the most out of your bedding plants. And Barbara Brown whips up a homemade buttermilk dressing. Today we're going to build another raised bed and our material of choice is using cinder blocks. Now cinder blocks are pretty easy to build a raised bed out of and they're readily available and fairly inexpensive. You can use cinder blocks to build a garden that really fits your size. So you want to think about how much you want to plant, how big of a planting area you'll need, and then also potentially the height. When you're purchasing your cinder blocks, there's two types of blocks to be aware of. The kind that have a concave edge to them, these are called stretcher blocks and they work well for the length of your wall. But for your corners, you want to find a block called a pillar block. And these have a square flat edge to one side of them. And to the other side, it is pretty flat, it just has a line down the middle of it. We're going to build ours that will be about four feet wide by eight foot and we're going to build one that's three cinder blocks high. We could use the same amount of blocks to build three raised beds if we were only using them one block high. So you have to think about that. We have chosen to use ours three high so of course that's going to limit the amount of planting space that we'll have. So for three levels high and four corners we're going to need 12 pillar blocks. Once you've identified the layout of your raised bed, the first thing that you're going to need to do is level the soil before you start placing your blocks. If you don't do this, the soil that fills your blocks will naturally level itself and you'll be able to see any indifference inside of that raised bed. So for us to first level our raised bed, you're going to need a flat shovel and also a long level. Because we're building our raised bed on crushed granite screenings, we're using those screenings to build up any low areas to ensure that those blocks remain level. Then at each corner we are using a square to ensure that they are 90 degree angles and that we have square corners. This first level may take a little longer to construct and that's because you want to make sure that it is as level and as square as possible to ensure that you're building a good foundation for those extra layers. We went ahead and installed our rebar after we finished our first layer. That's going to make sure our foundation stays set for that second layer. It'll help guide that second layer of bricks. Now when you start your second layer, you want to make sure that you're using another pillar block that has a flat surface. And last time you can see we came from the short side. This time we're going to come from the long side. We want to make sure we offset the bricks just like you would with traditional brick laying. Because again, we're on crushed granite and we want to keep those screenings as clean as possible, we're going to line our concrete planter raised bed with uh, landscape fabric before we fill it with soil. In order to hold that landscape fabric, we're going to go ahead and lay it down um, so that the edge is 
covered with that third layer of cinder blocks. Now that we have our third layer on, we're ready to fill our garden. Now I do want to mention again that we could have used the same number of blocks and had three beds. Here we only have 32 square feet of planting uh, surface area. You could have done three beds only one block high and had three times the planting space. While this is going to take a lot of soil to fill, what we're going to do is actually fill it first with straw. Now, straw is a carbon material, so it is going to tie up a lot of nitrogen. So we want to make sure that once we start planting our plants, we are supplementing them with nitrogen fertilizer. But this will help reduce the volume of soil that we have to use to fill our garden. Another added benefit of incorporating the straw is that it will eventually break down to add organic matter into our soil. Pinching, deadheading, and disbudding are a few terms that novice gardeners might be wondering, what exactly are we doing to our plants? But really, these are practices that you can do to help control the growth of plants. So first of all, we're gonna talk about pinching. Pinching is the removal of something that might be a little bit leggy coming out of a plant. And what it is, is you can either pinch it with your fingers, but it's really a better practice to use small little snips such as this, and to go in there and trim right above the node of the next lower set of leaves, or however far back down you would like to trim it. So this is a way um, to control the growth habit. You can see here on this other coleus, again, we have a couple of stems that are sticking up a little bit higher. So we'll just come back into this lower set of leaves and trim that out. So pinching is a great way of controlling the height of a plant. And now why would you want to do this? Perhaps you have a plant that you're growing in a greenhouse and it's just getting a little bit too large. It's not quite time to plant it outside. Um, and so you can go ahead and trim it back um, by snipping out some of that growth. And you can do this as far back as you want. And this is going to regulate and also create more of a bushy plant for you. So you can see we've trimmed it back by about a third. It's still got a nice shape to it. And each time you trim it back, you can see this is where we trimmed it. Now these two uh, stems will continue to grow and that's why it becomes bushier because where you had one stem that you trimmed out, now you're gonna have two stems growing from that point. You might have a house plant that has been inside all winter long and it's been stretching towards the light, towards the window or something, and it's gotten a little leggy that way also. So this would be an ideal application for pinching. So we're just gonna go in and you wanna be as close as possible to that uh, node right above that joint where the leaf stem connects to the main stem. You can see above here where it got pinched back and somebody did not pinch it back far enough. And this is a, not necessarily a major problem but can lead to disease because this part of the stem is not going to produce anything for us. And in fact, it's just going to start to kind of die back. So we're going to go ahead and remove that. It also kind of creates a tidier look to the plant. Now, there's another situation where you might use deadheading. This is patchouli, it's an herb. You can see it got pinched back, and we're gonna clean it up by pinching back those stems just a little bit more. Um, but herbs, a lot of times, we don't want them to flower because we're after the foliage. That's where the fragrance is in many herbs. And some herbs, once they start to bloom, then they'll die. So you might want to deadhead uh, some of your herbs to prevent them from flowering. Here we have a geranium. Again, we're in the greenhouse. We're not ready to take these outside yet. So we're gonna go ahead and trim back our flowers. This is called deadheading. 
So obviously we want to remove the flowers here because this will promote more growth, both of the vegetation and also the roots, before we get it out in the garden. But why would you want to deadhead plants that are already out in the garden? Again, there might be a couple of reasons. One, you have herbs and you're not ready for that plant to die or you're after the vegetation more. But there also are aggressive seeds that you might want to prevent from spreading in your garden. So that would be another case in which you deadhead your plants. Now, similar to deadheading, there is also disbudding. So here we have a geranium that we're going to go ahead and remove these flowers because a plant only has so much carbohydrates and sugars. And right now it's sending energy into making these flowers. And we're not ready for it to flower just yet because nobody can really enjoy these flowers before they go out in the garden. So we're going to focus that energy back into this plant by removing those flower buds. When we know we're going to be putting them out in the garden, we'll go ahead and continue to let them flower at that point. Now, finally, there's a couple of instances when you might do a combination. So this is a penta, um, and they're quite prolific bloomers. But sometimes you want to go ahead and remove those spent flowers. These aren't quite blooming just yet, but you can see it's getting a little bit leggy. So we're going to go ahead and pinch it back, but at the same time, we're disbudding it as well. So now we have a plant that's a little bit shorter. It will again flush back out and be ready to go in the garden pretty soon. Deadheading, disbudding, and pinching don't have to be painful chores, but in fact are great ways to control the growth of your plants in the garden. Native plants are all the rage these days, and we are here at Prairie Wind Nursery in Norman, Oklahoma, where Bill Ferris has been growing natives long before they were popular. And your mission really is not only to grow natives, but also just other plants that do really well in Oklahoma. Right, as we like to say, plants that not only survive, but thrive in Oklahoma's Th climate. That's what we're all looking for. And you you've bet. got a few for us here to share with us. You bet. And What's this one here? This is Malva viscous, or Turk's cap. Uh, it's not necessarily native in Oklahoma, but uh, this is, fills a lot of little niches. It's a, a tremendous hummingbird plant. They love this plant, but this plant will grow in the shade. So it's, uh, you were always looking for good ornamental perennials that will tolerate some shade, and this is a great one for that. And yep. it'll bloom just as much in yes. the oh, shade. Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay, and, and hummingbirds love it? And... Yes, you bet. Perfect. One of their favorites. So how large will that shrub get? It's going to not get a lot taller than this, but it will fill out. Okay. It'll be more of a shrub. Okay, all right. And then what do we have here? A couple of ground covers next to us. Right, and this is a, a, a Carex called Little Midge. And we're gonna use this in place of monkey grass as a shade ground cover. It's got some very intricate, delicate looking foliage and something that's got a little bit more interest than the regular old monkey grass. Yeah, I love the texture of that. It's yes, the bright green. Very nice, very and, nice. I bet it looks uh, great, great in a mass too. It certainly does. And then another one here, this is our Oklahoma native. I know this one, turkey tangle frog fruit. <laughs> right, and a tongue twister. It is. Phyla nata flora. And you can see the little pineapple flowers uh, there. But uh, of course, this has been growing in a pot in the greenhouse, so it's not as quite as dense as it would be as a ground cover application outside. Uh -huh. But this will tolerate some shade, is a good uh, uh, ground cover for you know rough areas. Uh, I found it growing just out in the middle of nowhere in the creek bottoms and, and uh, bar ditches uh, around the state. It's a very tough, durable uh, plant. And that one's going to kind of run across your ground, yes. right? Okay. It's spread and be really dense. You now, know, on the carex, will that do the same or will that kind of spread through underground rhizomes? Yes, or? no, it will spread. Okay. Yeah, okay. you better. And then uh, this is the, the Solidago, Wichita Mountains. I believe that Steve Biebrick, Sunshine Nursery, introduced this into the trades a few years back. Uh, you know, of course, all the solidagos seem to be uh, uh, good for Oklahoma, but this one's a little better behaved than some. Uh, <laughs> so if you don't want something that's going to be a problem and take over, this is a good selection for you here. And then this one, we don't want to touch it too much. It's a little prickly, but <laughs> yes, it has a beautiful flower on the it. The prickly poppy, beautiful poppy type flower, uh, excellent 
nectar source for the uh, insects, bees, pollinators of all sorts. Very interesting foliage. Uh, seed heads are very interesting and intricate. Mm -hmm. They are a little bit prickly. Uh, it, they will stick you just a touch if you get too close to it, but it's not, not like a cactus or anything, so not too bad at all. And, and all of these are perennials, right? The prickly poppy is sometimes perennial. Okay. It's mostly an annual. Okay, all right, perfect. And then we've got something down here that has a fragrance to it. it smells a little like a marigold. You bet. That's the uh, Tagetes lamani, or the Copper Canyon Daisy. This is in the marigold family. You can tell by the flower. as a very unusual fragrance. Uh, you can use this as as effective, if not more so, than uh, the uh, mosquito plant. Uh, the, the fragrance keeps the mosquitoes away. Don't rub it on your skin, just rub it on your clothing. Okay. Uh, you'll smell good and the mosquitoes will leave you alone. Well, great. And it has this gold copper color to yes, it? Yes, and it blooms in the fall. Uh, it's, if you're familiar with the uh, Tagetes uh, lacida, the Mexican mint marigold, it has kind of the bloom, same bloom cycle as it does and uh, uh, great fall color. So these last three are all full sun, correct? Yes, you bet. All right. Well, thank you for sharing these great plants with us. Thank you. So we filled our raised bed up with some straw to help fill some of that volume. But now on top of that, we've got a mix of topsoil and compost that we're going to add for those roots to get established in. Now that we've got our soil in place, we're almost ready to plant. But before we do that, we're going to add some nitrogen onto our planting surface area here. Because we put straw down, we know that it's going to tie up a lot of that nitrogen to help that break down. So we want to make sure that we continue to provide nitrogen um, to our plants throughout the growing season. As we incorporate this on top of the soil surface, when we plant, we'll be able to work that into the soil a little bit better. We have a couple of different varieties of squash here. Um, two are actually zucchini. Um, the one question that we often get asked about with squash is that your plant is flowering, but it's just not producing enough. Well, there's something you should know about squash. Squash are a monoecious plant, which means they have both male and female reproductive parts on one plant. Monoecious meaning one house, one plant. Now, the thing is, though, is did you know that squash actually have two different types of flowers? While they both look kind of this orange color flower, there's actually a male and a female flower to a squash plant. You can see here there is a female flower that they tend to be more towards the center of the plant and they have kind of this swollen part right below the flower bud. This swollen part is the ovary that once it's fertilized from the male flower, it will swell and develop into the squash fruit that we eat. Now these female plants tend to be closer to the center of the plant. If we turn it around here, you'll see there is a flower that's sticking well above the plant. And this is a male flower. You can see there's no swollen area below the blossom here. Now male, male flowers tend to bloom before the female flowers on squash plants. And that's kind of a signal to the pollinators to start visiting this plant. So you might find that your squash plant is blooming, but they're likely male flowers first, and then the female flowers will come on later. Now they'll continue to bloom both together in order to have pollinization happen. So this particular plant is a baby bush uh, zucchini. Now it is a true miniature in the fact that not only will we get a smaller plant, but we'll also get a smaller uh, fruit on it as well. We'll want to harvest this when the fruit is about four to six inches. So you can see we've got some fruit that's already starting to develop on these. Now with all warm season crops, you want to make sure you're planting them around mid-April. And we want to plant this at the level that it was in the pot. So unlike tomatoes that you can plant a little bit deeper squash, we want to make sure that we're planting it right at the soil level. So this is a smaller variety, so we can plant a few more closer together and we'll be able to harvest these soon. Now the other plant that we have here, it's also a zucchini. And this one is called Patio Star. And it's also a miniature and well-suited for planting in a container even. 
You can see here we've got some female uh, flowers that have already faded, but we've got the fruit that's starting to come on. We also have some male flowers that are still setting here. Now this patio star, while it's a miniature uh, plant, the fruit actually is going to be your traditional size on it. We've got a few roots here that are starting to wind around a little bit, so we'll kind of gently break those apart. And we'll move that soil in around that plant. Because these are miniatures, we can add a few more into this flower bed. We can't plant squash and not talk about how to deal with the squash bug because we all know that they will find our squash. If you remember from last year, there was some research that was showing how you can use a cover uh, cloth to protect your squash plants from those squash bugs. So that's what we're doing here. We've got some simple, cheap PVC pipe that we've bent. And the nice thing about this concrete block planter is it provides those holes to support our structure here. Now we're just gonna stretch some remay cloth over this and we will open it during the morning. So research has found that really our squash flowers are only blooming from about dawn to mid morning. So that's the only time that we need to allow those pollinators to get to our plant in order to have our fruit. Now if uncovering these plants every morning and afternoon gets a little too high maintenance, then you can do what's called succession planting. And that's when you plant another crop a little bit later. We could go ahead and leave these uncovered and keep the succession crop covered with remay. When the squash bug finds this plant, we can then go on to the next succession crop, uncover it, and begin harvesting from it. So if you're looking to build a garden or perhaps expand yours, think about building a raised bed out of cinder blocks. They're versatile and easy to do. Today we're doing something that almost everybody in Oklahoma seems to use, but mostly we buy, and that's buttermilk dressing, sometimes called buttermilk ranch. The stuff that you can buy is fine, uh, but to me it's really thick. So this is one of those things where you as an individual can make it more to your liking. You can also change up the seasonings in it. So it's really easy to do. It's not going to keep as long as the one that you buy, uh, but you can make it in smaller batches and uh, have it ready when you want to. All right, so I'm going to use and this again goes back to how thick do you want it. I've got a cup of buttermilk, and I'm going to start with about three quarters of a cup. And I've got a cup in here for those of you that are more like me and actually want it thinner. And then I've got a cup of sour cream. You could use a reduced fat version if you want to. I'm going to use the, the regular sour cream that's out there, in part because one of the issues when making or using buttermilk dressing is that the reason it's high in calories is because we use so much. So if you get back down to the recommended two tablespoon serving uh, or one tablespoon serving, then the, the amount of uh, fat in here is not going to be uh, unreasonable at all. So also I'm going to add two tablespoons of wine vinegar. I'm using red wine vinegar. You could use white wine vinegar. You could use whatever kind of vinegar you want to. Uh, also going to add to it about a half of a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. And again, remember, these are things that you can change the amount uh, that you actually end up using. Let me get this out of here. I'm going to whisk this all together in just a minute. I'm going to add a half of a teaspoon of black pepper, half of a teaspoon of kosher salt, or you could use a fourth of a teaspoon of regular salt. Uh, and I'm going to add two tablespoons of chopped fresh chives. And I'm going to stop there and whisk these just a little bit to kind of get it started. Now this is not going to be as thick as the one that you get in the market. You could thicken it up a little bit by uh, using less buttermilk. Uh, but you can also let it sit for a little while and it will continue to thicken up. I tend to use it more as a dressing over salad than as a dip. I'm adding a half a teaspoon of grated garlic. And grating is important on that one because you don't want it, somebody to get a 
giant piece of minced garlic uh, in their salad. Now, any of these ingredients you can increase or decrease, you can omit, uh, depending on what you're going to serve it with. For instance, if, you're going, if you've got some fresh rosemary, some fresh tarragon, you might want to cut back on the chives or the garlic. You may like something with more garlic. Uh, you could switch out the savory uh, herbs and switch in uh, more uh, sweet spices if you're going to serve it with fruit. So it's got a lot of flexibility here when you do it yourself. Uh, this is ready at this point. Uh, I've got a little tray of vegetables there that you could serve it with if you were going to serve it as a dip or you could pour it over the top. Uh, it also can go over a salad. As with all salads, remember that you're not going to want to do that until right before you're ready to serve it. I hope you'll give this a try. It's something different. It's got a different taste profile than what you buy in the market in a commercial jar. But I think you're going to like it. For Oklahoma Gardening, this is Barbara Brown. Next week, OSU Extension Vegetable Specialist Lynn Brandenberger shows off his cool season vegetables. Casey talks about using annuals and perennials, and we prune spring flowering shrubs. So be sure and join us then for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. Hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.